I'm Tim Ventura, and we're joined today by Rich Hoffman, Executive Board Member at the Scientific Coalition for UAP Studies. Rich has a BA in Organizational Communications from Wright State University and currently works as an Enterprise Architect at Redstone Arsenal and the Marshall Space Flight Center with over 54 years of experience investigating and researching the UFO subject. Rich has served as the Director of Investigations, Star Team Manager, and Director of Strategic Projects, as well as the State Director of MUFON and worked with numerous organizations in that field. So, Rich, welcome, sir. Thank you so much for joining me today. Uh, today, we're, we're discussing the Aguadilla UAP sighting on April 25th, 2013, which was caught on film over Rafael Hernandez Airport in Aguadilla, Puerto Rico. So this was caught by a U.S. Customs and Border Prote Protection DC-8 aircraft. Can you tell us a little bit about the backstory that led up to that video? Uh, sure. Uh so uh, bottom line was that the uh, the flight crew of that uh, that dash eight aircraft that were taking off uh, saw something unusual and uh, and they attempted to try to figure out what they could do with that video uh, after they uh, unloaded it from the equipment on board the aircraft uh, and they started passing it around to they went up to the Department of Homeland Security chain to see if they were interested and could wanted to look into it. Uh, and apparently they said that they, that didn't go through. Uh, <laughs> they, they didn't have any interest in it. Uh, they were referred to the Air Force. They sent actually the, the video clip to the Air Force uh, and the Air Force basically said, well, we don't investigate these things anymore. And they kind of like said, well, there's nothing to do with it. And so they, here they were, they were puzzled. They were wanting to get some sort of an answers about the, the actual object and what they had, what they had recorded uh, and decided to uh, look up. Uh, they passed it to an individual that was in Florida and they went through another pilot that was based out of, uh, of uh, Miami, Florida uh, and said, can you find somebody that can look into it? And then that individual passed it over to a friend of ours that's a MUFON member. He was the state director of Florida at the time. Uh, and his name is uh, Morgan Bell. Morgan took a look at it and found that it was extremely compelling and decided to actually, you know, go and meet with the pilot uh, that was that was in Miami. They had an opportunity actually to go aboard the actual, uh, actually a, a, a Dash 8 aircraft and look at the type of equipment. Uh, but found it very compelling and then tried to pull together a team of us within MUFON uh, that were in a kind of like a scientific mode, uh, you know, as opposed to the woo mode. <laughs> uh, we we uh, decided that we were going to take a look at it and we all felt that it was compelling enough that we needed to spend a lot of time on it. Uh, the Miami pilot asked us to sign non-disclosure agreements. So we couldn't even bring it up with MUFON that we were doing this investigation. Uh, so it, it had to be on the, you know, on the quiet. And so bottom line is we, we pulled together five team members. That was, uh, I, I mentioned myself and Morgan Bell, uh, who was a state director of uh, Florida. We also had uh, Robert uh, Powell, who is the director of research for MUFON at the time. And uh, he is also doing some sort of a, a science review board and had two other scientists that were also going to be joining us. And that was Larry Cates, who was a mathematician. Uh, and then there was uh, uh, a Carl Paulson. Carl is a, a, a physicist, a nuclear physicist. And so he, we became the five team members and we just, you know, called ourselves over a period of time, like the SCU as a scientific study for UA, UFO uh, ufology is what we called it at the time. And we were just a team name, right? Anyway, we got started on this thing and went, when we received the, the actual video to take a look at, it was about the November timeframe of 2013. So the, the, the event actually occurred in, in April 25th, uh, 2013. Uh, so we got started and having like over a period of two years uh, analyzing the uh, the actual video. 
Uh, and so that's kind of like the backstory leading up to how we ended up getting involved and why we couldn't talk about it with anybody. We had to work with this pilot who had given it to us with this non-disclosure. He actually checked our credentials and made sure that we were legit and backgrounds. Um, and the idea was that we would look at it scientifically, produce a report, a scientific report uh, of the actual case. And so that's kind of what happened. Mm -hmm. um, the, the other thing I'll point out to you is after we did the, about the two year study on it, uh, we produced a page for that. It's about, it's about 165 pages in length. Uh, that's including the appendices. The actual document is probably maybe more like about 45 pages or something of that nature. But uh, it had a lot of analysis that was done to it. Uh, and because it was a FLIR camera, uh, you know, a little bit more had to be done with it in terms of understanding, you know, how heat transitions into a FLIR camera. And it wasn't even a FLIR. It was a, uh, a Westcam camera that we identified. Yeah. Well, and, and so before we dig in too much in, in that, because I want to come back to that later, let's let's play the video. But again, I, I do want to preface this by saying so this video is documented in the SCU report. And I, again, I just want to put out an enormous plug for the SCU. It's explorescu.org. That's the website address. The work that you guys are doing is just heads and tails above the par in terms of UAPs, UFOs, and doing actual credible scientific research in this area. So, Thank you know, you. I, yeah, I, again, and I'll plug that a few times. I, I visit there all the time. You know, the, the work that you guys have done is just stellar and it, it's amazing. So, but let, let me do this. Uh, let me share my screen and then I'll play the video. Just jump in if anything. So we see the object that's almost in that little reticle that there it's it's basically I just want to point out to you uh, in the video that that black is hot on thermal uh, and so it's set for white is cooler. So I just wanted to kind of point that out to you for a second. Uh, there's a there's an aircraft down there on the one way that was a FedEx plane that we looked at. Here's the object now you it is zoomed in on whatever this object is as it's coming around. Uh, they're do I'll talk about they're doing a circle. Um, there's a lot of uh, points around the screen here that I'll just mention, but right there, you've got a situation where we're going by some cattle and we use the cattle to be able to determine the temperature of the object, <laughs> by the way. So anyway, the object is moving around. It's got some sort of like a, like effect around it that we're picking up on as well. It was generally about three to five feet in diameter because at one point right here, you're gonna see it coming up to a supermarket that's in the background. And it actually goes behind a telephone pole. But right now it's coming across what looks like the runway. Um, then you kind of see it uh, as the, uh, it's approaching that supermarket that I was mentioning. There's a supermarket. It comes down and there's a telephone pole that goes behind and then it starts to go behind some trees. So it's getting lower in its altitude. It looks like the speed is very consistent on this. It's slowing a little bit, but I mean, yeah, this is, it, 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 it doesn't look like a bird. It doesn't look like somebody had said maybe it was a couple of Chinese lanterns that were tied together. It doesn't look like yeah. those. Yeah. I'll talk about the speculation of that stuff later, but um, then it gets down to a point where it's starting to get down near the water line, and that's almost about where it came in, by the way. Uh, but it now it zooms in, and you see the object. We actually saw splashes from the water, and when we looked at it on pixel level, it's now going underneath the water. You can still see kind of like an effect from it, uh, just as it dips below the water level line. Yeah, and I could see it below the water. So this is yep. the transmedium travel. And, and again, we'll, we'll come back to that in a bit. Well, yeah. So now he zooms back out. And he's still looking for it. Um, so you've got a situation where it kind of comes up and you'll see it get darker. Now, typically like objects when they go in the water are cooled off. <laughs> this actually gets hotter. And now it gets hotter, comes up and it splits into two objects with two thermal signatures. And you see the the one object that kind of like trails off and eventually just, you know, I guess it goes in the water, disappears or something of that nature. The other one hangs up. Uh, and then the pilot who is now heading further south, 
uh, is actually now like going to look for it because he can't find it. He pans the camera back and forth and around trying to see if it'll pop up anymore, and it doesn't. Um, and so then you notice that aircraft that was being held because the control tower said, hang on, we got an object, is now finally taking off late, by the way. And then that's the uh, the end of the video you got. So uh, are, you, are, you, are you able to pause it at this point? Yeah, yeah, I, I can. If you can pause it, let me just talk about all the metadata around the screen. And that's it's real critical that you kind of got to get an understanding of that. So as we go from the top left, you'll see it says 26 April 2013, uh, but that's 125 Zulu time. And you have to then back that back. And it's actually April 25th, 2013. And it's about roughly about nine o'clock at night, uh, the Atlantic time. Okay. Well, let, let me do this. Let me rewind this. We'll play this again. You can you can describe you can describe the metadata. So you were saying that the time zone is is off there. That's well, what what displays is the Zulu time. And that's what they typically use with aircraft and, and stuff like that. But the actual time on the ground was different. OK, can you stop it there for a second? Sure. Oh, I was going to. Well, I couldn't. I was going to show you that. That's the FedEx plane. You'll note that the, the FedEx plane is being held there. Uh, the control tower, which is just kind of like down below where the camera apparently is or something like that, is actually now looking at uh, and in contact with that, telling them to hold up. Um, but anyway, so you have a situation where if you look, you'll see that the N and there's like an arrow pointing down. That's pointing toward north. Okay, okay, so north is in that direction. Uh, you've got the sequence of numbers, the 030201. That's kind of like the, it's looking down at a negative number. But if it were coming straight up and looking straight ahead, that would go to zero, zero. So and it's kind of like me... looking down at an angle, right? You can see it change as it's doing it. The other thing that I'll point out to you, where it says, it says L1 or LI, LI off, disarm, and stuff like that is that's the laser indicator. It's actually that reticle there, how they actually locked in on the target and used that, they would have been able to have actually tracked it and got the appropriate distance that it was. Instead, ah. what's happening where that reticle is, it's actually pointing at the ground. And so that when it comes over to the bottom screen, you'll see it says the aircraft's time, uh, it's, its latitude, I mean, it's, it's, you know, it's position GPS. It gives you the 241, 243. That's the degree or the bearing that it's at, the altitude that the aircraft is at. Well, so, so it sounds like someone was manually tracking the camera. They there. were. They were. Okay. They were. They, the, the, I'll tell you the story in a minute here. But bottom line is he's, he's actually moving the camera around as the aircraft is circling it. Okay. So on the bottom right, there's a target and the LOS. And that's giving you the GPS of what the, the reticle is pointing to. So it's actually the ground distance and the location. So somewhere between the aircraft and the ground is the distance of where the actual object is. And a lot of people assume that it's at the end of that, and that's incorrect. It's actually, it could be, it could be very close to the air, uh, aircraft or it could be at a distance. So you had to use reference points of like trees and other kinds of things to get a, an appropriate indication of the actual uh, object itself. Now here it's pointing at the water at approximately the location of the actual object, right? Yeah, and so there it goes we, under the water again. Yeah, so you now have that that location of the of the actual object in relationship to the uh, to the actual. Uh, location if you know you so when you when you did analysis on this i think that you guys had said the estimated speed was between 80 and 120 miles an hour something around those lines right correct and where we had to do the the, the measurement we had to account for the fact that the fact that the aircraft was actually circling so there's a parallax effect that happens you know if i if i swirl around you in the background behind yeah. you you have things moving around pretty quickly, but you're kind of stationary, correct? Yeah, yeah, so that makes sense. You, you have to rule out 
when you do that measurement of that and you're because we broke this thing into 7027 individual frames and almost looked at it pixel by pixel we're able to now take a look at the the metadata and compare that back it off and also get that parallax issue uh you know understood that the aircraft is moving and at certain points you're able to actually make out where the camera is keeping consistent on the object and you're able to then make a determination of its speed yeah now before so before and we're just about at the end of this one again before we close this down i should ask with this video um was I, i'm sure that the original because this is on youtube the original was probably higher res have you guys run this through any kind of an upscaling to see if you might be able to pull more data out of it or get a more clear picture yes and so we did the best we could to get the best image possible and then work it through so we could actually do a, an appropriate analysis and so uh and then when we put it into a tool that we use uh that's actually uh used uh by the uh, national institute of health to do incredible amount of like work it's it's actually free uh and available for use but but we we image j is the tool and we use that to actually go in and you can zoom in up to 800 power mm. uh you could you could literally go through and you could do an analysis using the tool to be able to break it into different shades of grays if you would so we went from you know like a, a white at being like zero up to a black scale at you know and it's like 255 different shades of grays you know up to a black right yeah and you could you could then take and you could look at the pixels and do a comparison with that and the actual shades of those grays yeah, and, and that was how you guys pulled out the heat signature that was it was it was really an estimate based on those pixel colors and then comparison to known objects because i saw aircraft on the runway and automobiles driving and things like that yeah so. and so uh we 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 identified critical papers like for example the temperature of the surface of the asphalt what would that be uh what would be because that was in the background we also had cattle that were out in the field and we could use the temperature of the actual cattle uh that, because we found again what that would be roughly about you know around 100 degrees uh and then we estimated that you know if you looked at the actual object you would see that it's not like one consistent color either mm. I mean it's not like all just white or black and at times yeah. at times it varies you know and so you have to also factor in the, the that it's potentially rotating or turning and so maybe you're getting an angle where there's some sort of like you know refraction or reflection of heat that's different but you you don't see it being like for example a consistent color and so it's not even a consistent temperature is, is what I'm getting at so, but we did measure uh, to the best of our ability when it got to the black point, uh, it was about 104 degrees. And we were able to determine it's roughly in that ball game, if you would. Yeah. Um, so, so in terms of this video itself, one of the things, and again, I, I went through the report last night. I actually went through the entire report, the, about 151 pages. I went through it like three different times, looking for data points that I could really focus bless in you. on. Bless you. Oh yeah, it's it's a again, it's a wonderful <laughs> report. The work that you guys do, and let me plug the URL. It's explorescu.org. The work that you guys do is so detailed. You know, you try and take everything into account. And I think that's what just puts that credibility so much higher than, you know, other material that's out there. But so in, in terms of authentication, obviously, it's always difficult to authenticate these things, especially when you've got these chain of custodies where it's, you know, you've got non-disclosures non and stuff like that. But um one of the things that your team was able to do was cross correlate radar data with the position of the aircraft that took the video and so basically it sounds like and, and actually there are some videos that i'll put links to on the website as well for this um where you guys were able to look at the radar data and say okay this dc8 that was taking the video it was flying and here's the flight path based on the radar data and then we can kind of car cross correlate where the camera was pointing from there is that is that how you were able to validate that correct so you know obviously we were able to look at the radar data and we were able to get the aircraft identification 
And then we did the comparison to find out that it actually is a military uh, ID that would be there. So we were we were we were confident. You know, when you when you when you're dealing with like an image like this, you're saying you have to validate everything. You know, <laughs> you have to you have to validate that there was an actual aircraft that it was legit that this is not being faked or at all. And so, uh, you know, there was a claim that it was a Dash Eight aircraft, and there was a claim that there was a crew on that evening at that time. And so, bottom line, you need to confirm: was there an aircraft? That was there a military aircraft in that vicinity taking off at the time that they said that it was? And so, all that matched up when we when we did the analysis work to, to confirm that okay, this looks like a legitimate you know aircraft. It, it was a you know, and we were able to get it from there. So we validated that. Uh, we validated its flight path, and then we were able to match its path on the actual you know, image of the area in terms of GPS locations. And so we were able, able to track each of its points and what it did. Uh, we were able to get a, a, a speak through the Miami pilots uh, as in, in to get a hold of the original pilot who was still down in Aguadilla uh, and to get our questions answered that we posed to them. For example, mm. you know, uh, what happened with the object? Did you contact the control tower? What did you have in the way of a conversation with the control tower? Well, you know, uh, because, you know, when they took off, they were cleared for takeoff, right? And they're taking off from the Rafael Hernandez airport heading towards the northeast. And, you know, the moment that they get up in the air, they're looking out and they're seeing this like pinkish light that is now coming from the water toward the actual uh, airport. Well, yeah, so let me let me ask a little bit more yeah. about that because this is something where again, when you watch the video, and I focused on the video, I'm sure most people will. So there there's more to the story. They saw a pinkish light, and and from what I'd read, that disappeared as it came close to the airport, right? Yeah. So they saw the the light coming in, and let me give you a little bit more background because you know, first off, they're going on they're dealing with drug uh, smuggling missions and that type of thing. They have a specific mission that they had to do on that evening when they took off, right? It's nine o'clock at night. I know that this is thermal. You're seeing just the heat signature from the thing. It looks like it's daylight, but it's not. It's nine o'clock at night. It's dark. There is a full moon up in the air behind them. And the, uh, and so that that is coming into play as well. But bottom line is they see that pinkish light and then they're contacting the control tower and saying, Hey, I thought you said that we were cleared for takeoff because we're about ready to head over that direction, right? Circling it. And so, wait a minute, you know, okay, what's this? And th they look from the control tower and they also see the pinkish white li uh, light coming in toward the, the airport. And so that's why they held up the, the aircraft from taking off uh, in, on the uh, runway, the, the, the FedEx plane you know, hold, you know, because we've got something coming in. So bottom line is they, they see this object, right, at night. And then what happens is, th so the, being that that was lit up, uh, the, the, uh, the Marine, uh, the, the, the crew taken off on the CB plane, uh, you know, CBP plane, Customs Border Protection, they, they actually circle, or they start going around it. And so they make a big arching loop around it now, they're not filming at this point. They're just going around it and watching it because they're concerned if this is a drug smuggler or whatever. So then the light goes out and they're thinking, well, okay, this could be drug smuggling. I'm going to keep watching this thing. Yeah. And the fact, that, the fact that it was not cleared or nobody knew where it was and the control tower said, well, we don't know who it is. We don't understand. They said, we're going to go around again. You know. So when the light went out, the pilot contacts in the back seat and tells them to turn on the thermal camera and start recording this whole thing. And so they did, they turned it on, they started manually zooming in on it and, and followed it around. And they went and made another circle around the object, this time filming it. And as they're going kind of around the object, they then start, they have to head off, by the way, to go to their southern route to do their mission for that day. But they recorded that three minute and 54 second kind of like going around it uh, and saw it do this kind of thing. Um, 
Well, and, and so I think also, and if I'm correct on this, so we had a visual, an initial visual sighting yeah. by, by the, the FedEx crew, as well as the airport crew, right? The airport right. staff. And then you have, obviously, we have the, the FLIR video, the infrared video from the West Cam in the DC-8. And there was also radar, right? That yes. There's a radar so, signature. So that's three so, different confirmations, three yeah. different spectra, three different types of data saying this thing was there. Yes, and so what what we uh, what we ultimately did was we we applied for uh, FAA uh, you know basically radar data because we were uh, I told you we had confirmed that that was an actual legit aircraft, but we we actually started to look at the data that we received uh, and we started to note that there was an object that was roughly in the position where the object itself came from prior to it you know and so. So the situation, and by the way, that radar, those radar blips that are going on don't happen anymore after the object is now coming toward the airport, right? So, I mean, okay, so you could conceivably say that there, it was a coincidental that there was this like blip that's moving around. And by the way, we actually measured the speed of the blip of the radar. And we found out that it was going like 1200 miles an hour. So, I mean, so even from position to position, that that was changing rather remarkably, uh, you know, in terms, and we got like about 50 hits that that almost like happened prior to this thing coming in. So uh, that was compelling also, you know, just looking at the radar data that they kept getting. Uh, anyway, so there's the radar data, then there's the visual sighting of the object, and then couple that with the fact that they now turn on their camera uh, and, and they actually get that, that, that film there's a lot of sensory input and data that you can analyze and look at and oh by the way the fact that you have the metadata on the screen that you can now look at gave you a lot better way to now analyze the entire complete video yeah i was going to say that's that and that's pretty much everything that was available yeah. at the time yeah. so this again this thing is really well documented well so let me ask has dhs or the federal government made any public statements about this event like I, the navy came forward after the nimitz uap videos were leaked and you know initially they at least said yes those are our videos those are legit you know and and i think since they've opened up a little bit more and of course now there's the the investigation going on has there been anything similar with this video so there was a foia that was requested of dhs to give to have them give us some information and that was to a, a friend of mine billy cox uh applied for trying to get that information i think and anyway the bottom line is i think that the report back on that was that they were denying that they they didn't come out and say that this is ours, although that they I think I believe that they did in some ways because they said with the fact that it has all the metadata on it, it's they were concerned about it giving away their tactics and you know techniques and procedures, much like the now what you have with the Navy, where they're wanting to not give you any of this thing because it shows our tactics, techniques, and procedures, right? And they want to make everything classified, right? So I think that the fact that it got out and they were radically embarrassed by the fact that they they didn't do anything with it probably, and uh, you know, and the fact that they didn't control it, uh, it, it became an embarrassment for them. And uh, and so, but they have yet to ever come back and say anything like, well, you know, yeah, it was something. It was an unknown and and anything like that. At least to our knowledge. I do know that in talking with Lou Elizondo, that that they were aware of the video, uh, at and and that they they I think that he did say something to the effect that uh, that they kind of like looked into it, but they didn't really get too much in the uh, uh, a, in the the actual program that he was the head of ATIP. Yeah. Yeah. Well, again, this is one of the most remarkable videos, you know, and, and that's why I'm, I'm, I'm so excited that you were able to join me and help promote this because it's, I, I think it deserves a lot of attention. And also it, it demonstrates the transmedium travel where it, it pretty clearly goes into the water and travels under it at high speed. And the other thing was where it splits in two. I thought that was really interesting. I, I'd almost wondered if that might be gravitational lensing. You know, where maybe it isn't actually splitting, but if there's some kind of a gravitational field or some kind of bending of light around it, it could make it appear to split in two, you know, and, and have all sorts of strange 
visual effects and that's just speculation right? sure and we did a lot of you know speculating too because we were trying to figure out well how, how do you explain this number one is there any craft that we have that we know of that and we can look into uh where it can go into the water uh and come up out of the water um you know, just that alone was pretty incredible. And the fact that it hit the water at about 100 miles per hour and didn't break up. Yeah. That tells you that, well, wait a minute, it's probably not something like a simple drone because a drone hitting the water at that speed would have been pretty incredible. And you, you so we did find that there is a, uh, there was a study that was, the Navy was looking into the thing called a flimmer. And the flimmer was uh, basically, think of a torpedo with wings. Hmm. And the idea was that, you know, you could have it fly down into the water and it would move underneath the water like a torpedo, but it doesn't come back up and it doesn't split. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, exactly. You know, and it, it's not even that shape. So, I mean, the shape is a, is one thing alone because it's, you know, it, 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 this thing even changes shapes as it's moving along from the heat signature now again. That's the heat that you're seeing. And then you have to assume that, that there could be some sort of a field around it. And it's potentially interacting with the atmosphere. And that's also the reason why you can't see a very clear object. And you're seeing a heat signature could be that there's like some sort of a heat uh, effect from the actual object itself. Yeah, yeah, there's there's definitely a lot going on. And it's pretty obviously not a bird or a Chinese lantern. I, I would say this one is it remains a pretty clear anomaly at this point, at least from my perspective. Yeah, and Tim, we also did, you know, it, we did the due justice of going to a FLIR technician and asking him to actually use the Westcam camera uh, and actually record what birds look like, what mm. what do balloons look like, uh, and it, there's no match for the, the thermal signature that you're getting from this uh, with any of those types of things. So... A bird's not going to be looking like that. Uh, you would see flapping of wings. Uh, the, the the camera is so capable that it can measure one one hundredth of a degree difference. That's how sensitive it is. Uh, so, I mean, what I'm trying to tell you is that, you know, when we compared that against natural objects, there was no match for it at all. Uh, the shape wouldn't have looked like that. Uh, it's not It's not a party balloon. It's not a, anything like that. Uh, it's not a, you know, the different Mylar balloons or anything of that nature. Although what you have with a lot of the skeptics are, they want to be able to, again, going back to the idea that you have that, if, you're, if you have the aircraft here and you have the, the, the GPS location down here, somewhere along that line between that is where the object is actually located. And a lot of people want to go and tick, point it down to the end down here and say that the plane was circling around it and it was barely moving. That's not the case. When you take a look at the actual pixel levels, which none of these people did like we did, and see that you could actually have reference points for its location, you know, yeah. then you then you know precisely where it was and you know that the shape and the pattern of it was. And we also passed that off to Japan and France to look at, and they validated our path was accurate. Well, and it, it also peer seems, review. I mean, right? Yeah, it, it clear seems enough. clear just looking at the video also that this thing is moving at a pretty good clip, much faster than a balloon. And, you know, you could see it crossing, I mean, the actual motion across the airfield and, you know, by comparing it to moving through the waves. And there are lots and lots of references. And so even if the, you know, even if there was a parallax effect happening, you could still see the object itself is going through. I mean, you could see it going under the waves right we we have a rough idea how big a wave is this Correct. thing is is moving and it's moving fast and yeah. you know and and it's through a dense medium so yeah i i it's it's definitely an interesting anomaly and and worth worth further research so a uh, rich let me let me thank you very much for your time today i i want to close by giving everyone again the the url for explore seu.org i'm going to put all of the links to this in the notes. And before we go, I'm wondering if you can tell us what's coming up next for the SCU and how people can help support your mission. Well, we have, first off, we have quite a number of studies that we're doing. Um, I think you're gonna be impressed with the, the quality of the work that we're doing on all these different studies. Uh, let me give you an example of them. 
uh, we're looking at intent around nuclear sites. Mm. When the, the sightings were uh, happening around nuclear locations, they were at storage facilities, they were at production sites, they were at transportation sites, they were also at detonation sites. So we are actually looking at the cases around that to see if we can determine what's the intent of the object around those locations. Uh, and so that's an intention study that we're doing. That's uh, it's now almost in its second year and it's got great results. Number two, we're looking at the uh, atmospheric effects and water effects from these things from the standpoint of propulsion means. So we're doing an analysis and study on that. We have a whole team of people that are looking into that kind of thing, the electromagnetic effects, the small effects that happen in the atmosphere and water or whatever. So we're looking at that. Uh, we also have a USO study where we're looking at, you know, the locations and seeing where locations of, for USOs happen most. Uh, we have a shape characterization or a characterization study that's going on that's over a period of time looking at the different kinds of shapes of the objects. And we're using predominantly cases that are like well grounded and well researched and studied, you know, to be able to do that. So it's not looking at birds that were misidentified or something of that nature. Um, and then we also have uh, another study that's going on right now, which is actually looking at drones. Uh, we want to be able to discriminate better between drones and the UAP. Uh, and so let's look at the, the, the cases and see if we can help to determine what could be a drone, a potential drone to help us eliminate some of those things. Uh, we're seeing objects that are being reported to the FAA that are doing things that are not drone-like, you know, uh, and so let's learn about those. So that's kind of like where we are. We do these long-term science projects, if you would. <laughs> it's not like you're going to see a, like, you know, a, just because some video popped. Oh, oh, we also did the analysis of the, of the rubber ducky video, by the way. Mm. And that's about ready to come out uh, very shortly. It, it's, it's already gone through its peer review. Um, so, and we're currently also analyzing the video uh, that was taken on Catalina Island by the UAPX team who we're partnered with. I'm also a member of the UAPX team as well. And so uh, we're, we're actually analyzing uh, something like 60 hours worth of, of FLIR video to see what we can learn from that. So that's, that's kind of like where we're at, Tim. Wonderful, wonderful. Rich, thank you again so much, sir. You're welcome. Thank you for having me.